In the last two videos, we looked at possible sources of variation in our sound signal. One source of variation was due to having more than one allophone in a phoneme. So our phonemes can have different manifestations depending on context. For example, a T can be pronounced like a T in telephone or like a R in butter. So this variation is due to phonemes. A second source of variation was due to speech reduction, where sounds are compressed. And so some phonetic cues for a sound could be embedded into a different sound. This is the example that we had with Friday night, which was ultimately compressed to just brah. So we have um, phone phonemic variation and phonemic rules and reduction as two possible sources of variation. Here we're going to look at a third source of variation, sociolinguistic variation. As we saw in week three, there is a constant tension when you speak between wanting to sound like the people close to you, like the people you like, and wanting to not sound like the people that are not close to you or that you don't consider your group. So there's a constant tension between wanting to sound like your in-group or the communities that you belong to and not wanting to sound like an out-group or the communities that you don't identify with. And of course, humans um, perform these identities of each community throughout their lives. So there can be many different identities that you perform as you go through life. Maybe being from Boston, maybe being from your group of friends in high school and so forth. And each of these is going to pull your sound slightly in one direction or another. And everyone has their sounds pulled and pushed like this over the duration of their lives. On week three, we saw how this process, if you fast forwarded a thousand years, could eventually lead to different languages. Here we're gonna fast, fast forward it only 50 or 100 years. With enough time and enough of these changes, which can be because of the in-group, out-group tension, but also because of just random changes over time, enough changes are going to accrete that you're going to have different dialects of a language. And we can see this, for example, in the US. This is a map for a very simple uh, pattern in the English language. How do you pronounce those two words? Pause the video and try to pronounce them. This one and this one. And then try to figure out if you're pronouncing them the same or different. Pause the video. All right. The English that I learned has them as the same or merged. I can I say caught, caught. People in the red areas here have these vowels as different, and it will be something like caught and caught. So as you can see, different dialects of English of the United States have different pronunciations of these. This is just one difference in these words, which accounts to a pattern where these two vowels can become different, which eventually spreads through the entire language. And when you accumulate enough changes, you eventually get areas that sound different from one another, that in effect have different dialects. For example, having someone sound like they're from Boston or from the South or from California and so forth. And um, there's variation in every human language from Briri, which has three different dialects, to English, which, which has numerous dialects in the world. I want to show you very briefly what the word two sounds like in other parts of the English-speaking world in this Max Planck website. This is a map of England, of Britain. And two. This is Northern Scotland. Twa. Twa. Two. Twa. Twi. Twa. Three, 
Two. 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 And this is just within the British Isles. If we zoom out, Two. you can see pronunciations, for example, from Nigeria. Two. From South Africa. Two. From Australia and New Zealand. Two. 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 And from the US. Two. 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 So this is just the word two. These are all of the different ways that this word can be pronounced throughout the world, depending on when the person on where the person grew up. The English language has considerable geographic dialectal variation. But again, this happens in every language, uh, big and small. As I mentioned, Bribri has three dialects. Japan has numerous dialects. Uh, for example, the object on the lower left is called sushi on the western and central parts of Japan. But in many parts of northern Japan, this delicious food is called sisi because these two vowels, the u and the i, have merged into this more central vowel. Sisi, sushi. Every language has variation, and we're always going to be facing this problem. If we want to create an, a speech recognition system for Japanese, it has to handle people who call this food sushi and, who also, and those who also call it sisi. Or in English, it has to handle all of those 30 or 40 ways of saying the word two. And this is just an example of geographic variation. The, uh, the identity that you perform by being from somewhere. I am from the US, from Australia, from New Zealand. There's many other identities that you perform throughout your life. The identity of being from a certain generation, uh, young versus older. The identities that you perform because of your gender, gender identity or your sexual orientation. English in the United States, for example, has a distinct um, gay men dialect that has different uh, changes, for example, in the way the S is produced. You have changes because of ethnicity. There is African-American vernacular English in the United States. All of these uh, different personas that we perform throughout our lives are going to pull our sounds in slightly different directions. So it means that everyone's using slightly different versions of English and the language itself is changing all the time. So our speech recognition system is always going to be chasing a sort of moving target. It's always going to be aiming at a sort of platonic English when in reality we have all this beautiful and incredibly diverse English language or any other language that we're working with. In summary, in previous videos, we saw several sources of variation having different allophones for a single mor morph uh, phoneme, like telephone, butter, which are two sounds for a T. We can have variation due to speech reduction, where a signal is compressed and deforms and changes the, the sound. We can ha oh, a third source of variation is due to sociolinguistic variation, geographic, temporal, and because of the identities that we perform. Language change is always happening, and um, we're always going to have to capture a lot of variation when we're designing these systems. All of these issues make it so that there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the bit of the spectrogram and the word that we should be transcribing with the speech recognition system. So because we have so much variation in the phonetics of human languages, performing this task is going to be incredibly complicated. In the next video, we're going to look at a few more challenges involved in creating speech recognition systems, and then we're going to look at some architectures for these systems.